Um, so we're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. We had some um, last minute changes because of the storm, but uh, we're all very delighted to be here. Uh, my name's Soraya Shamali, and I'm a writer, and I do a lot of advocacy work in tech and media uh, in relation to diversity and the way systems are built and implemented. Uh, with us today, we have three great people for the purposes of this discussion especially. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Kimberly, who's at the end. Um, Kimberly Bryant is the founder and executive director of Black Girls Code, and I'm actually going to leave it to each speaker to talk a little bit about their professional experience and what led them to be here today. And um, next is Ann Toth, who uh, very graciously agreed to join us, maybe uh, earlier, an th ago. about an hour ago. <laughs> 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 when we <had laughs> So um, Anne is is here uh, as head of privacy at Google and um, oh actually <laughs> oh wait that's not a job oh that's right no 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 I'm so sorry <laughs> she's with Slack technology she was at Google um, that was a good job too they're all good jobs they're all good, good jobs they're all good the jobs I, want. I should just let them introduce <laughs> themselves um, and. <laughs> you each other. We're to you can, each other. You know, so we can just take these, stuff. mix them up, and then read them out. Um, <laughs> remember all the jobs we've had. <laughs> it's been a, there's a few between us. And I'm going to mess. I'm going to Nula. Your Nula. Um, and Nula is the president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology. And um, so today we're really going to be talking about a full spectrum of topics. What we'd really like to do, though, is hear from you about what you'd like to talk about. I'm going to introduce a range of questions. Um, and as we proceed, please feel free to put up your hands, ask questions to continue the conversation. If at any point we're going long in any one area or the the discussion seems not to be leading anywhere productive, I, I, I reserve the right as moderator to, to stop it at that point. But um, we all felt very strongly that it would be terrific to hear from you about the things that you're encountering, the solutions that, that you're looking for uh, as, as we proceed. So with that, I'm going to hand this over, um, and we'll start with you. Just to give yes. an introductory of yes. the so there's so many ways to take this conversation. Um, we're all going to talk a little bit about our personal work experience, but also what kind of drives our thinking. Um, I'm at CDT, a 20-year-old advocacy organization here in Washington, D.C. Many of you know it. We work on a full range of digital, civil, and human rights issues, predominantly privacy, surveillance, free expression, a number of issues. Um, we're also working on what we're calling the idea of the digital self and technology in daily life. And I see a need for diversity of all sorts, and, and I don't just mean the classic and most important traditional diversities of race, gender, ethnicity, national origin, et cetera, but div diversity of viewpoint and experience in building products that create this new digital world. Without diversity of, of viewpoint and experience, we end up with stories like the Oculus uh, kind of um, uh, reality uh, visual device that didn't really work for women because it had only been tested on men. I mean, that's just one kind of device-specific experience, but also in simply building product and building decision-making and data collection and algorithms for this incredible always-on uh, digital world that we're all going to be living in, we need to ensure that all viewpoints are at the table, are at the design phase, at the product development life cycle phase. It's, it's a, an exciting time to be part of that conversation, and we're, I think, doing some great work on, on building in fairness and equality and diversity into the algorithmic structure of, uh, of technology in the coming years. But that, as we've discussed in, in kind of prepping for this panel, really leads to the decisions about life uh, pipeline for designers, engineers, and product developers. These are issues that are kind of fundamental to our society. And they start, as we were discussing, with the littlest of children and what we tell our sons and our daughters about what is cool and what is fair and what is appropriate and what girls can do and what boys can do. And all of us, I think, have, on this panel have had a child come home and say something surprising about an assumption about what a boy does or what a girl does. Uh, and I mean that in the professional sense, not the personal sense. Dude, that's another conversation. Um, but uh, you know, when, when uh, my daughter said to me, Mom, I saw a woman testifying on TV and said, Mommy, she's a CEO too, just like you. I'm like, that's great. Like, that's a really great story. There have been other not so great stories where you know, one of my daughters will come home and say, well, you know, girls can't be lawyers, you know, or girls can't be president or whatever. And so 
we're all doing our own little brainwashing at home, right? And so it's the question of what kind of values you're, you're inculcating from the lowest level, but also what are the educational opportunities? There was a great article that I, I sent around, um, I think at work recently, about uh, the educational system in this country and what kind of in values and decisions it's reinforcing, and are we creating kind of a, a hierarchy of the most elite schools and the, breeding more <coughs> children of those parents who go to the same elite schools, and are we creating kind of a caste system? Um, I spent some portion of my career as an educator early on, and I, I'm very concerned about what is the pipeline that we are creating, and are we creating divides, digital divides, lifestyle divides, at the earliest possible moment, based on geography, based on race, based on gender, based on economic experience. So all of these factor into kind of creating a digital world that is fair and that promotes kind of equality and democratic values, not only in this country, but globally as well. So my name is Ann Toth. Um, I, uh, uh, yeah, so I was aware of this panel an hour ago, so forgive me if I don't <laughs> seem as prepared as Nula. Um, I have spent the entirety of my career in Silicon Valley. So I joined Yahoo in 1998 uh, as a data miner, uh, data miner number two. And it happened to be the year that, uh, that the FTC sent their first report to Congress on online privacy. So within three months, I went from being a data miner to being a privacy advocate within the organization. So uh, happens to ask just a lucky coincidence. But I spent uh, 13 years at Yahoo leading privacy, data governance, uh, and all internal policy that applied really across all of our products and services for 800 million users worldwide. So lots of issues that have emerged that we've grappled with on speech and community and how you deal with uh, a very diverse user base, not just in terms of gender, but background, culture, et cetera. So I uh, did that for quite some time and then moved over to Google, uh, uh, particularly on the, uh, the Google Plus product where we were building a social platform for Google products. And again, thought a lot about how you build products uh, for not just a diverse user base, but how you think about some of the issues that I know we're going to get into today about um, speech and harassment and how those products are used by men and women. So have spent a lot of time working within that community. As a policy person doing technology policy, you tend to actually see more women in the room than you do when you're sitting in the room with the engineers, the designers, and um, the product managers who are actually building those products. You find far, far, far fewer women and far, far fewer people of color involved in the actual building of these products. Products. Um, but I think that's something that we within the Valley have been spending a lot of time thinking about. I'm really happy to say that there are some things that are changing on that front. My current role actually is at Slack Technologies. I've been there um, since the end of last year and one of the responsibilities I've taken on at Slack is to build a culture uh, that is diverse, that is inclusive. Uh, our CEO thinks a lot about the, the uh, in particular, he, he encourages us all to be thinking about the end user in an empathetic way. That's something that he actually has spent a lot of time thinking about. And I think if everyone were more focused on user empathy, products would be considerably different from where they are today. And the last thing I'll say is I'm actually a native of this area. I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia. I was in the first graduating class of the Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. So I am one of the very first real geek girls spin my propeller very hard. Um, and I am I just felt like I needed a little credibility on that front to bring to the party. So there it is. Um, my name is Kimberly Bryant. I'm the founder and executive director of Black Girls Code. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we really focus on introducing girls of color from underrepresented communities, um, African American, Hispanic, and Native American communities to technology with a really focus on changing the dynamics of diversity in the tech space. Um, when you look at the tech space, it's overwhelmingly male, it's overwhelmingly um, not people of color uh, across any demographic, male or female. This is one thing that came to my attention um, as an engineer myself, only because um, 20 years after I was had graduated with my degree in electrical engineering, I just happened to be a mom of uh, a little girl who was more of a geek than I ever was growing <laughs> up and was really what we call a digital native and spending an inordinate amount of time, I thought, as a mom, on the computer or, or doing games and doing all types of technology things. And when I looked towards getting a way to increase her interest on a more productive side and looking at opportunities to um, build on that interest in a classroom setting, 
I found that the environments were not very diverse. And, and to be honest, they weren't diverse at all. Um, there were classrooms and many of these summer opportunities that were full of boys and, and maybe a handful of girls and no students of color. And I thought that was quite interesting, um, given the fact that I graduated, you know, 20 plus years ago when there were just a handful of women and we weren't at the peak in technology that we are now. So it, that really propelled me to action, um, moving out of the biotech sector as an engineering manager to start this organization and really drive at finding solutions to address this problem and really change that ratio. Um, what I found in living in the Bay Area is that there's no lack of opportunity or need for engineers, um, but they just don't seem to be tapping into those communities of color that have lack of access to this technology. So I think it's interesting that um, we're about 50 years or so past Brown versus, versus Board of Education. Um, when we looked at Brown versus Board of Education, those issues were um, creating equal opportunities for education for our young people today. So even though we achieved that similar goal, similar goal with um, Brown versus Board of Education, I think the playing field has changed. So now when we look at these same schools and educational opportunities for our students, they're not equal, as Nala mentioned before. They're not equal in terms of access to these key core skills that are going to be what our youth need to be equal and active participants in the 21st century and beyond. And that's, I think, the primary issue from a policy perspective that's concerning to me, is that making sure we create educational opportunities for all of our young people and not create a permanent underclass of individuals that are not technically savvy enough or don't have the technical skills to really be active participants and not just consumers in the technology space. Uh, so that's really where the focus of my, my work resides and also what I hope to add to the conversation. Thank you. Um, I, I just have to add this because last year uh, Kimberly won the American Ingenuity Awards from the Smithsonian for the work that she's done and what particularly resonated with me um, with this panel as we spoke was an emphasis on K through 12 education. Um, I think that any of us who have been involved in this field immersed in it, understand that when we're talking about imbalances at leadership levels and at corporate board levels, that those imbalances actually start really before children are practically almost in school, in their self-awareness, in their self-identity, um, in their visioning of, of how, how they participate in the public sphere. Um, so one of the things that I would like to turn back uh, to you is this question of the way policy tends to look at technology as technology and not so much as socio-technology and how we can make that shift so that we understand the dynamics that we're dealing with in terms of the broader culture that we're living in and not so narrowly focused on what an individual might do in a hostile space. Um, so. Oh, thank you for taking that up because that is definitely the direction that you know we are taking our work at, at CDT. I want to talk about two themes. Um, one is we have a great team of lawyers and policy people and analysts and increasingly a team of computer scientists and engineers. But where I want to see us grow is in our conversation with sociologists and psychologists and talking about the relationship of the individual to each other as mitigated through data and, and devices and software and hardware and how that information flows and that relationship has changed with the government, with the industry, with each other, with our institutions. And I, I just love Kimberly's comments that they were exactly right. Um, we really are looking at, at these issues as societal issues. So that, that reflects the fact that, so I was at a college that was a heavily engineering college, but I ended up in the humanities. So clearly I'm thinking about this like an English major, right, not a, as, a, as an engineer. Um, but, it, but it is so true that um, we are not prepping our children, and this is not just a readiness, a com it's, it's a competitiveness, it's an economic workforce issue, but it's also a how are you, you said it just right, not just a consumer of the technology, but an active participant in your digital life. When my daughter asked me the other day, mommy, can you teach me some coding so when I go to coding camp this summer, I'll have a little bit more knowledge than the other kids? I thought, 
wow, I'm doing something right. And yet I can't because I'm not a particularly gifted coder, right? So I've lied to her right, on some level. But, um, but that's the right question, and I want to encourage that. And so it's structural. It's K through 12 structural right. and, and academic curriculum. And there's a group called code.org that's working on adding computer science and engineering as a core science in the K through 12 curriculum and, and passing laws and of course meeting some resistance understandably from the educational uh, you know, uh, uh, bureaucracy, but I think that's a really necessary set of skills to be able to question you know, the technology, to question what the man behind the screen and say, you know, is this thing making the decisions that I want it to make about me? Because it's not just the data, it's the decisions as we all know, right? And then I'm, I'm looking at, at Eric Stallman, one of our, our wonderful staff at, at CDT and realizing I forgot to mention our great work on net neutrality and the copyright and a whole bunch of other issues, but when, when people talk about net neutrality and digital, you know, they, they um, and digital divide, that it's a Rorschach's test, right, for what you think it means in many cases, but, you know, digital divide can mean not just rural, urban, you know, ex socioeconomic, but kind of experience and knowledge, and so we do need to get everyone to a level playing field where they are informed and intelligent and active participants. Can I ask you a, a specific question that maybe both of you can address? Um, I come at that, at that from the perspective of gender because there are about 200 million less women engaged online than men in the world. <clears throat> but only about a third of countries include gender as a factor in their technology plans. And that's also true here, by and large, in our policy. Um, are you, do you see that internally in your organizations? Is um, raising issues of gender and other forms of diversity going beyond what I would call lip service, right? So those are very hard conversations to have when the people with power in an organization tend to be white men. Even saying white men, I have come to appreciate, feels like an act of hostility, right? So how do you navigate those conversations to get beyond the point where everyone's saying, yes, we care about diversity, right? Because it's not, it's not integral at the moment in the way that we know it needs to be horizontally and vertically. So are there, are there things that are working from that perspective? Are there techniques that you would advocate being more profusely applied in policy making? Uh, that's, a hard, that's a hard question. I think um, in my experience, so Silicon Valley is, is not, uh, it's not just predominantly white. It's, it's actually, there's a very, very large Asian and South Asian right. population. And actually, Anil Dash wrote a really interesting blog post specifically about yeah. uh, the Asian male perspective mm -hmm. um, and how it impacts uh, the dialogue. I think it's um, the Silicon Valley and technology companies in particular are all about data and measurement and meritocracy. And there's this notion that um, if we talk about, at least I, I get the, the energy around this, that it's, if you talk about it as being a problem, um, it's a problem. But if you just don't talk about it, it's not really a problem. Right. And, and recently, though, I've been gratified that we are talking about the fact that, that these are underrepresented populations mm -hmm. and we're talking about it in a very positive way. But for a very long time, the conversation has just been, has been this idea that if you work really hard. Yeah, as an individual. Be, as an individual, right. you will be recognized and, and there's, and just like Stephen Colbert, I don't see color. Yeah, that's right. It, right, but, but people do, so. Yeah, David. Um, I think your comment about empathetic products mm -hmm. answers each of your uh, comments. I think if you, give me an example of an empathetic product, because it seems to me that to the extent you can find one, mm -hmm. you don't have to talk about any of those directly. Well, so designing with empathy in mind and engineering with it in mind, I think, are, um, are newer concepts. Uh, people, and, and if you have if you have women in the workplace who are building these products, if you have people of color building the products, they're thinking about the end user in a different way, perhaps, than, um, than <coughs> someone who's not. So I think these are, that is the benefit of having a diverse workplace. But that being said, you know, it, it's not that empathetic products can't be built. And in fact, Facebook has a whole team dedicated to this idea. Social compassion idea? Right. Of this, well, that as well, right? I mean, I think those are compatible. Uh, in terms of empathy and some examples of actually building with empathy in mind have to do with knowing your end user. It's really just a very simple concept of knowing who's using your product and building with that person in mind. And they're not, that's not one individual. When we were, um, one example I think that uh, I'll raise, when, when I was working on a social product, one of the challenges in a social environment is harassment and this sense when you are 
female in particular, that you um, you feel the brunt of these engagements in a slightly different way than when you're male. And allowing those people, for example, to block certain users, to have access to features, to be able to report that sort of behavior, empowers that end user. Um, there is also a, this idea that if you build the product correctly, then you can eliminate that problem before it even happens. And perhaps you can, but empowering the end user to be able to do something about that situation um, is, I found, actually, uh, even if it is a smaller, it's, it's very hard to explain, but if, even if it's a smaller action that they're able to take, it has greater meaning to that end user than not. Right. I mean, right. it's because it's, the, the counter to that is that you could argue that, um, that it may be a sense of control. It may not be actual control. But even having that sense of control is incredibly empowering. And I don't think you can underestimate what it means to that end user in that situation to have that. But I'd so. like to bring this back around to the question of not just em empathetic mm -hmm. product development, but the actual connection to who's doing the designing. Yes. Right. Because so a lot of people will say, <laughs> I have empathy. Right. I can yeah. do this. And it's right. simply not the case. Even the most empathetic person in the world is not equipped to build these products in ways that meet the needs of diverse pluralistic communities. Right. I, I think to that point, um, one example that I have, um, I don't know how many folks in here are on, on Facebook, but Facebook did um, a, a product on their platform at the end of the year called the Year in Review. Mm -hmm. And yes. there was a lot of kickback. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. no, there was a lot. But there was some kickback <laughs> from folks that was like, oh, my gosh, why would they do this Year in Review? Because everyone doesn't want to see that. And when they do it, it's, it's pretty aggressive in how they push it out. And so they, they received some negative feedback from that. So immediately, from a technology standpoint, I'm looking at that, and other female engineers that I know are like, well, we wonder how many women were on that team, that right. design team, that thought it was a good idea to make this year in review that you can't opt in or out of, and you have to see it. Um, and I think that goes to the point of not having a separate department. So for me, as an engineer, when I used to be designing these type of things, if we were going through the design process and then we had to bring in an empathy department to look at our design at the end, mm -hmm. that's not going to work because all the engineers right. are going to be like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. uh, right. And that's, that, it, that's why it needs, excuse my French, but that's why it needs to be a part of the team makeup, that we have a diversity of opinion at the design table right. when the designs are being done. So that when we're going through this product life cycle, there's a, a diverse set of opinions that kind of push back on, is this really a good idea to have the year in review automatically pulling this data? And you know, how do we design this to be more empathetic and more sympathetic to a diversity of users? You know what I'm saying? And so that's why I believe that it's so incredibly important to make sure these teams that are doing the design, that are doing the actual coding, um, yes. because that's what's going in and what's going out they have to be diverse. It can't just be a team of males and then a separate empathy department to come in and... Well, and, and but in all fairness, I don't, I don't think they operate I'm quite just that saying, way. I'm just pushing back on a little bit. But I'm, I'm just, you know, kind of pulling their coat a little bit. So, <laughs> it, so it really um, needs to be more direct. In we in tech always think we've invented everything, right? We, you know, everything is brand new to us. And so I'm, I'm thinking of analogies to other industries that have the aha moment that having a diverse workforce actually is better for sales and better for bottom line, right? So think of advertising and marketing, realizing that... 70% of packaged goods are bought by women in this country and suddenly realize maybe you want women on your leadership teams at Procter & Gamble and whatever, and sales go up because they're actually making advertising and messaging that resonates with the person who's actually spending the money. Um, and then also, I, and I think it's true, we can all be empathetic, but it is it is most effective when it's your own life that you're building for. And I'm mindful of our uh, design team when I was at Amazon who were all, many parents of young children. And this is actually a great thing, right? Because one of them came to work and said, my kids are all stealing my Kindle. Like, I'm really <laughs> tired of this. And they're, like, running up charges, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And they developed Kindle free time, which I could wax poetic. I will sound like an advertisement, so I don't want to say that. But it's a great child-centric, safe space that's parent-controlled, that, that reflected, frankly, the daily lives of the three guys I'm thinking of, you know, who are all parents of very young preschool and toddler children. Um, and that was great. And it was a huge, you know, a great 
product and a great sales, and it reflected literally their daily lives. And then they developed cases that kids could throw on the ground. That, uh, thank goodness, because <laughs> my kids drop mine all, all the time. Um, and so it's it's really is technology and daily life and building for a diverse you know experience. Um, and I think one of the biggest actual digital divides we have in tech, and it reminds me of my my time at DoubleClick. Remember that twenty mm -hmm. years ago was where you had an engineering po engineering population that was so far ahead main, of mainstream consumers in terms of their understanding of the technology. There was a real and Mark remembers this too. There was a, just a disconnect between kind of what was a cookie, right, and what was a digital profile, and what they were, I and mean, what they were doing by today's standards looks so benign, right? And but but at the time it was death defying, right? And there was just a disconnect, a, a, a technological knowledge gap that we, I guess, in, in in tech really need to be mindful of, being educators and being responsible stewards and being empathetic. But there's also, I think, a bottom line. It, it, Anne's right that the conversation is difficult with senior leadership, and you have to be really committed to do the kind of hiring that reflects the values that you want to espouse in your organization. I am going to pat CDT on the back a little bit right now because we have gone from 25% women to 50% women in one year. I am incredibly proud of that. Thank you very much. But diverse in a lot of different ways, in, in viewpoints, and in sexual orientation, and race, and gender. Um, and, and the next horizon for that kind of diversity in hiring is looking at the, the org chart. And where are those people? Are they all at the bottom? Are they all at the top? You know, is, is, are they all siloed in kind of what we'd call helping professions in corporate America, the HR or legal or whatever? Um, but you've got you've to be committed and you've got to be looking for those candidates. If they're not coming up the pipeline from K through 12 and colleges and universities, that is a very hard thing, even for the most honorable companies, good companies I've worked for, when you're trying to hire top talent and you have a very limited pool and you're in XYZ state that nobody wants to move to or whatever you're hiring challenges are. So we could be helping. Do you think the industry should, in that case, really be looking to other industries? I mean, there have been, there have been industry sectors that, faced with the same problem, identify smart, capable people who can be brought in and retrain. And, retrain. Mm -hmm. and that's always an option. I haven't seen a lot of discussion about that. Well, I in hope this it's field. an option because I think, you know, when, uh, so I applaud Intel, right? Their $300 right. million dollar, uh, investment in diversity was a big announcement mm -hmm. and everyone was very pleased about it. But there's a lot of cynicism among women. Yes. We were having this conversation and, and someone asked, well, what, what are they going to spend it on? And the reply came, sex change operations. I mean, it, right. because, <laughs> right? I mean, that's perhaps the fastest way to get there. But it's a long, it's, it's, it's seen as this very long-term insurmountable problem right. that we got to invest today. And maybe 25 years from now, we'll have women engineers out right. there. There's no reason why well, women can't learn to code low. now, right? Um, this isn't a problem that we, that we can keep pushing off into the future. There are plenty of women who are right. entering into these fields. Um, why aren't they? So that brings us to the larger question, I think, of what we always call the women's problem of work-life balance, which thankfully is not being considered a women's problem anymore, right? And so that that's a national issue. It's not specific right. to, to this industry. Um, but are you seeing um, intransigence to, to those ideas? I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about flexibility stigma and the fact that in order you know, to have men spend more time at home, which is really what has to happen in order for the invisible labor of women to take place in another way, um, there's a lot of <laughs> stigma attached to that. And so are there initiatives in the world that we live in to address that? Have you seen things that work? Are you seeing well, resistance? I'm seeing there, well, first of all, I, I was, I'm increasingly pleased to see uh, parental leave policies that give men more time off. Uh, Change.org made a big announcement about offering men and women equally 18 weeks of paid leave uh, with, for baby bonding for the, the introduction of a new child into a family. And I thought that was astonishing. I thought that was great. And a lot of technology companies are leading the way. Susan Wojcicki uh, wrote about this in the Wall Street Journal about her own. She's taken five maternity leaves at Google. Um, so that's, that's pretty impressive. And they have some really interesting data on that. But when Sheryl Sandberg wrote her book, um, I blog, my blog, I worked with Dave Goldberg at Yahoo, and he's a great guy. And she's right that when women, when the most important career decision a woman makes is who she marries in some respects. Uh, but I blogged about that. And I said, you know, I think she's 
absolutely right. But what I want to read is not her book. I want to read Dave Goldberg's book on what it's what it is to be a man supporting a woman like Cheryl. Because my husband doesn't need to hear it from Cheryl. He needs to hear it from Dave. That's going to be more impactful to him. Um, Dave hasn't written that book yet. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, but I think that uh, that's one of these things. It feels like we're we're asking those questions, and those are conversations I think that could be happening in that community as well. You're right to posit it is not just a women's issue, though it's a family issue. What I'm worried about is uh, folks who are who do not have children, right? And and making sure that there is fairness, there's flexibility in the workplace for whatever your passion is, whatever your. Because I worry I worry about that a lot because I'm so out there about the fact that I am a single mother of three right. school aged children, and everybody knows it. And one of the first pieces of negative feedback I got in my first year at, as CEO of CDT was, you talk about your children a lot publicly, don't you? In all your speeches, you mentioned the fact that you're a single working mother of three young children, and they're all 10, 7, and 5. And I said, I'm going to keep doing that until it's not unusual for a senior woman at my so level important. to talk about the fact that she is a working parent of three young children, school age, 10, 7, and 5. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's sort of like that, who's at Joss Hedden, who said, you know, why do you write strong women? Because you keep asking me that question. So um, it's the same principle. Mm -hmm. I will keep talking about it until it's, it's boring. And there are other people. And the feedback I get, of course, that was, I'm sorry to say, a man who said that. Um, but younger women come up to me and say, thank you so much, because I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like, I don't know how I'm going to continue working and have children and do all this thing. And I do get the how do you do it question a lot. And that's a personal conversation we're not going to have on the panel. But, <laughs> um, I don't sleep a lot, no. Um, but it is, it, is, it is a balance. It is, I, I'm not sure. I don't like the word balance, right? It's, it's an integrated life. I do like the construct that millennials, I just took a, I was, I audited a little course on millennial management. And it's no longer a, because I do that in my free time. I, you know, I work to GE. We, we study things like org charts, right? And so it's fun. Um, so it's not a work-life balance. It's not intention. It is an integrated life. It, there's a fluidity. I should not get mad at the junior staffer who's on Facebook during staff meetings. I still do, but I will get over that, right? So, but it is, it is an integrated life, and we have to be respectful of true diversity of experience, right? So it's not just the fact that you have children and you need to leave for your soccer game, but that you have some other hobby or passion or interest that you are entitled to. And I want people to have happy, healthy lives and not just to be all about work. So it, so how do we integrate that? And the first is have kind of flat, we have a great spa sabbatical program at GE. Everybody's entitled. You reach a certain number of years, you go. You know, that's that's healthy. And, and we've just instituted yoga, which I think I'm <laughs> proud of. Anyway, so there are lots of ways to, to respect work-life balance. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Hi. Um, I have a question going back to the integrating children, especially in K-12. One of the interesting challenges I've found, um, even when children or minority children are interested in, in, in working in STEM field, the hurdle is the parents. Uh, either because there is a generational disconnect or they're just not sophisticated enough to understand that it is a career, that it is uh, the future of this country. And so I'm, I'm interested to see how, how that has, how you have implemented you know, policies to change the mind Uh, That's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we've done at Black Girls Code is integrate a full parents educational series into our workshops. So often when the girls are coming into one of our after school workshops on a Saturday, we're doing a parallel class for the parents alongside of that, where we're bringing in partners from like Google, partners from LinkedIn, and these are professionals that are talking to them about their career paths in STEM. We also like bring in educational partners as well, so we want them to see the broad, broader picture of STEM in terms of the different pathways into using um, technology as your career. So n every student we know that we work with in our community are not going to go the traditional four-year college route. Some of them may go community college. Some of them may not go to college at all, and they may do the boot camp type route. But that's a viable way to enter into the STEM field. And we want our parents to be able to guide these students whatever pathway they choose. But parents is really important. One of the things that I would definitely highly recommend taking a look at is Google did a study. It was, it was particularly for girls, but it does have data for boys as well on the different influencers in terms of students in their um, career choices in STEM. And one of the key um, pieces for, that they found in that study that parents played a vital role and that student's career choice, especially for um, children from underrepresented minority uh, communities. Uh, so that's one of the things that we found that we must build into our program in order to make it sustainable and make sure that the students both stay in it and feel supported. 
Yes. I'd like to actually pick up on that and take it even a little further. I worked a while ago in early childhood education, and a lot of discussion about how important it is to get K-12 and maybe even earlier get kids interested in science, maker, uh, all of this. But in technology specifically, you've got a lot of people, especially in the edu early education arena, who don't feel like tech right. and screens, et cetera, are developmentally appropriate for young kids. Right. How do we... We had Break this debate. That. So we had this debate at Amazon, right? And all, and it's still going on. How much screen time? How much is the light behind the screen keeping your kids awake at night? I mean, these are the same conversations we had about television 50, 60, 70 years ago. And and there's gonna. I think the onus again. I think there's some responsibility on the part of the companies to to do some of the research and do some of the education and do some outreach. Amazon did a great program with the National PTA to make Kindle the e-reader, you know, book of the of the the, P, the recommended PTA model. But um, even in my my girl's school, the teacher said you can't you can't bring your Kindle to class you can't do your required reading on Kindle it has to be on paper and so these are you're absolutely right there's an educational again opportunity I think some of the onus is the dialogue between industry and maybe industry advocates um, and and uh, and parents and and educating the parents I think that's a wonderful program that you have because that's exactly a group that that hasn't been touched and so we are we're seeing the difference between the digital native and the digital immigrant in that space and uh, and you're 100 percent right there's still a lot and there's a lot of good and bad science out there on when kids should be reading on what as well. Uh, so um, I'm a mother of three. I have three boys <coughs> that I'm raising to be very good feminists in this world. But I think, uh, uh, and I'm a little bit of an outlier. I think it's great if kids learn to code in you know kindergarten, but I don't think they need to. I think the most important part of, of educating kids is, is goes back to the issue of stereotypes yep. and expectations. And, and those things start exceptionally early for everybody. Um, you know, it's uh, just, and I know there's been the whole notion of band bossy and, and some <laughs> of the work that Cheryl did around that also has been controversial. Um, but I think it's important. Those are the sorts of things that when you look at the types of performance feedback women get repeatedly in the workplace, um, that whole business about how assertive are you and why is that a negative for a female and a positive for a male in the workplace, that starts at the very earliest ages with girls and boys in particular. Right. So I think if we focus on anything, it's about, it should be focusing on that. Um, there is something interesting. Um, it, Common Sense Media has an education technology summit uh, that addresses some of these issues. And and at this year, this year's, one of the conversations was how to train teachers on tech. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point about it not having to, to be machines that the, that the kids have, um, this issue of stereotypes and stereotype threats that affects the children really affects the teachers first. And so, for example, a female math teacher who has math anxiety passes that on to girls but doesn't pass it on to boys. And those classroom dynamics are still being left unexplored. So until we have a situation where teachers are being trained in implicit bias, stereotype, and stereotype threat, they'll keep perpetuating, whether they have a technology tool or not, the same ideas. So the fact of the machine is actually secondary to the fact of the stereotype threat that's implicated in the lesson plans and in the classroom setting and on what's, you know, what's in the walls. I think Anne makes a great point, though, that it's not just the curriculum. It is actually the the, the bias that we all live with every right. single day that we are, frankly, a lot of us were hardwired with ourselves and sometimes aren't even aware of. And that's a harder societal conversation yes. to have. I think, you know, with so much research has been done on eating disorders and not what not to say to your, you, I have two daughters and one son, and what not to say to your kids about what they eat and that sort of thing. Very little is said about what to say and what not to say besides girls can do anything, right? right. You know, there, there's <laughs> that. But, you know, uh, talking to your kids, I mean, Obviously, for me, the personal is the political, right? I right. go to work every day, and that's what I'm teaching them. But, um, but the, it's a very interesting conversation, and I still see a lot of very outdated so messages from from other. Here's a question yeah. for all of you, from the broader perspective of policy. Um, I think technology companies should be I investing in um, ideas related to socialization that we're talking about right now. Um, and education in general, right? So, the the investments being made in having how to how to get kids into STEM will actually be far. They'll have far less ROI unless we address some of these broader issues. Um, do you think that's feasible? Do you think that's? I mean, that it just seems to me that things like socialized speech dominance, which is what we're talking about in the workplace, that starts 
because parents interrupt girls twice as often as they interrupt boys, right? Um, is there any, it's such a deep, profound effect that's, uh, that's we're seeing. Um, have you seen anything particularly work? <laughs> Are we making it up as we <laughs> go? It's a ve well. It's much much harder, right, to yeah. to change that than it is to invest in a in a program for a girls' summer that's camp right. in STEM, right? I think that's it's an easier way to do that. Those are things that are that are going to be perhaps slower shifts, and right. the fact that there are women like us, that there are women um, that are that are uh, that are notable, that that that. It's to that extent, the fact that there are role models that are right. available, um, people of color, people uh, outside the, the standard. I mean, stereotypes are pervasive and very, very hard to change. Um, we haven't solved it, right? I mean, right. It was, it's... But it's interesting, though, because in the 80s, we had a peak of women in computer science. And then, right. I mean, we are in a backlash generation, yeah. right? I mean, it existed. It's just that kids don't know it existed before. So... So we've seen the peak, and we're at a real low, a historic low. You're seeing hopefully. this all over education as yeah, well. I saw were, the president right. of Princeton speak on the fact that there were no women, no women undergraduates taking leadership positions right. in student government, in that's major in all in organizations, and that sort of thing. So there, I mean, it's, it's I don't want to say it's terrifying, but it, it is concerning. I have another child who said to me, "Mommy, I don't want your life." Right? I, God, this is like a group therapy. Thank That's you all. Right. For, thank you all for joining me today. This is awesome. Um, no, but I mean, these are this is feedback. This is right. what you know. They're looking at me, going, "Wow, that's well, hard." It is a backlash right? generation. Though. You so it, really you know, this it. is you're right about the numbers. I've been watching the numbers and the, the numbers of computer scientists speak. And again, I graduated from college in 1989, and we had a huge class of right. engineers and computer scientists where I was. And uh, those numbers are dwindling in in all the those disciplines, um, and so you you talk you've got a curriculum front end pipeline issue. You've also got a societal how do you structure an eighty hour work week when you are the primary caregiver, right. what you were alluding to before, and what are the kind of societal governmental regulatory policies that support uh, a a two career family, which are increasingly the norm in this country, um, and how do we normalize? I think you're right. There's the inherent and, and the more hidden bias, and then there's the structural. You can have all the structures, and women are still dropping out the higher right. they go in companies. So to go back to the question of policy, um, if, if you could each pick a policy that you'd like to see institutionalized, a change that would make a huge difference, um, what do you think it would be? I've just put you on the spot, I know. <laughs> but there's so, there's so many, but there are some that, that might. Government policy? Government, government policy. government policy. Paid maternity leave. Paid maternity leave. Yeah. Paid, pater paid, paid, mater from, paid parental leave. Parental paid parental leave. leave. Oh, right. But. Since we're one of the three countries along with Papua New Guinea that doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Paid, paid parental leave. Child care, tax credit. Which well, I think the president just credit. announced it. So I'm <laughs> definitely um, a fan of what um, Code.org is doing with um, technology as a, as a science uh, and really making sure that that's integrated into definitely all of our public schools as a minimum requirement for graduation, students graduating. Does anyone have questions about those? Yes? Yeah, hi. Um, great panel. I really enjoyed the discussion, and uh, especially you know about STEM and integration of girls in um, in STEM early on. And I'm really glad to see the diversity in the room and with all the men in the room. So, thank yes, you so much. thank yes. you, thank you, <laughs> thank you for showing up. Yeah. It's, it's true. Usually these conversations yeah. tend to be full of women, and we cannot solve this problem without the men in the room. So thank you. Um, my question, actually, I have three questions that kind of. <laughs> are in the same direction, but I would love to hear from the panel on, um, as I, I'm a woman in technology, I work in technology right now, and as I could go back to work tomorrow, um, I'm curious to hear, what is your message to a male tech manager, like if there is a male tech manager in this room that is a hiring, you know, constantly making hiring decisions and trying to, um, you know, uh, overcome this challenge of diversity, what would your message be to the male tech manager? Second, what would your message be to male colleagues who, um, which is something you alluded to earlier, who keep talking over women in meetings or don't include them in happy hours or social events because you know it's a bro thing to do and that sort of stuff. And finally, as a woman in technology, um, how would you hold your manager as well as your colleagues accountable 
without basically starting a war. I mean, you want to work with these people, these are smart, intelligent people, and so are you, but you want to collaborate together and see a certain trend at, at the workplace. How do you gently, you know, uh, become part of the, of the club? Why be gentle? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know. But there um, is always the risk and the hostility. Oh, there totally the is. Thing. There totally is. But I have never, uh, you know, so I'm a little unusual in that uh, even though my career has been in technology, uh, this is my manager now, my boss, is really one of the, uh, he's the second manager, I mean, I've ever had. For 12 years, I had uh, a, a woman manager at Yahoo for 12 years. She was employee number five at the company. She was the senior most woman. I actually, so it's a little unusual that I've lived in this predominantly, even in, a, in the technology space, I've worked with women. And I think, um, so I, I, so this whole having a boss that's a guy thing is sort of new for me, to be honest with you. It's, it's a little, it's different, right? I know it's, it's very, very unusual. Um, but I have never, ever been, I've never gone quietly into any room. I've never left quietly out of any room. And it's never, to me, it, thankfully, it's never been, um, it's never been a, a, a hurdle or a burden. But, um, but I guess my, I think if more people, I feel like if more people locked arms with me and were just loud and proud and out there, it would be easier at the end of the day. But I could be. But your point too, though, is that this sex segregation is the model for our entire workforce, not just in tech. So that, so that the sex segregation, you happen to be in a space that was dom dominantly women, or at least had women in leadership, whereas in most of STEM, it's that's not true. the case. The outward-facing, public-facing, customer-facing things tend to be more women, right? I have often asked myself, would I be where I am today? Would I be as successful as I have been in this space if I actually, if I hadn't had a, a female manager and a mentor who who was uh, who made space for for me? So right. it's unclear to me what if it would have been different. I don't know. Emily, um, do you have as part of the program with? young girls, do you talk explicitly about these dynamics? No. <laughs> um, we don't because our girls are like from seven, they go as right. to up to 17. So they're, first of all, it's a bit of a heavy issue to talk to girls at that age. However, we do like have a heavy focus on mentorship. So we do events where we bring in senior women that have uh, been successful in their careers to talk about their journeys. And so doing some informal and some formal mentoring in that, in that respect to kind of prepare them for what they, the workforce may be for them once they reach that point. And also really place a heavy, um, a heavy focus on self-determination and confidence within our programs, because I think that's what you're speaking about. The way you present yourself, it speaks to your level of self-confidence. And I think that one of the things that women, as women engineers, we struggle with at times is if we don't have that person that buoys that self-confidence and, and builds you up, that's very hard to be that bold in all situations when you don't have other women or even male. So some of my mentors as an engineer um, throughout my career were not women. They were some of my male um, supervisors. And when I, I used to bring my, so I'm like you, I talk about my daughter all the time. I bring my daughter to work because I've been a single parent forever and I always want people to know. Like when you see me leave at four o'clock, I'm taking this little girl right here um, to her ballet lesson or whatever it is because that's an important part of my life. And I was just lucky to have um, many male supervisors that supported that and they were supportive of that. But every woman doesn't have that um, type of environment, that type of manager. So I feel that it is a, I don't want to use balancing act. I think you have to learn how to navigate in the spaces that you find yourself in and be uh, a bit, it's unfortunate, but we do have to be a bit of a chameleon to be able to um, get our what we need to do in our careers and find those advocates to help us navigate those career blocks. Because I don't think there's always going to be that supportive person, um, but you have to find those advocates. That's like key right. uh, to navigate the space as a woman. You have to find not just those mentors, but those sponsors and advocates that will help you navigate around those models. I feel so I, that's not a good answer, but that's that's exactly what I'm I gonna to just do. take. Yeah. Um, we have ten minutes until you have to get on a plane. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> get in a cab in ten minutes. So we have one question in the back. So, very interesting discussion. And a couple of different things, um, and just a slightly different take on it because I'm not quite sure that I would agree that talking to a young girl 
um, age seven or eight um, about some of these things is inappropriate. Um, and I think about it sometimes in the context of my niece who is 10 and, um, you know, telling her that she can do whatever she wants to do, I think is important. But I think that that needs to be put in context. I think that, you know, some of your experiences, you know, are, I think are few and far between in that, you know, if you're saying going, I, I don't think I would ever say to her um, without some caveats, you know, be, you know, be more aggressive in, in that kind of a situation because she's a little, you know, there are some stereotypes, particularly for black women, that come with doing those kinds of things that unfortunately, you know, will, will, will go with them for a long time. Um, the general comment I wanted to make is that one of the things that I think is problematic is that diversity is not something that we do, it's something that you should, you should be and you should have a commitment to doing that. And if you don't have the buy-in from the top down, then you're going you're gonna to have to, as, as a person of color, as a woman, kind of tread lightly through the organization that you're in. And so it's one thing to have the discussions at the bottom and at the middle. You can have all the mentors in the world, but if you don't live or work in an environment that fosters that, and if you don't live in an environment and work in an environment that um, is conscious, of the stereotype, is conscious of the deliberate and the not so deliberate things that come along with that, then there are going to always be these subtle things, there are going to always be these unintentional things that people just do. And so I really think that it's important that it's nice for all of us, uh, and this room is more diverse than the room I left, to have these kinds of discussions, but if you're not having them in the larger context, and if there's not somebody at the top saying that this is going to be a diversity experience, then you're just going to continue to have those kinds of issues. Right. There's a gentleman right in front of you. So, if I may, I'd like to just drill down a little bit more on that in the way of accountability and policy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ryan, uh, it's no surprise to anyone that the track record of hiring African Americans and Latinos in Silicon Valley is dismal. And it's not just engineers, it's all the functions of the business and public relations to law. Given there are no laws and no regulations, and not much you can do from, from a policy point of view, what can you do around either technology or social media or anything to have some capital? Well, I think some of the things we, we've started to see uh, with the release of those EEO reports, that was like a big deal. Um, because that just happened in the last six months or, or less. But uh, we've been working in space for three years. So we've been saying for three years, there's a problem. There's really a problem. And I think that the tech companies realize that they're a problem, which is one reason they didn't want to give up those numbers. <laughs> um, so seeing that, you know, now that it's fully transparent, uh, that's like really big for everything that's happening in the tech space around youth education, diversity, inclusion. That's like really, I can't stress that enough. That's like key because now it's all on the table. So now we can look at ways, there may be policy ways to address some of this lack of diversity. I think you're going to start seeing a shift in that now that it's very apparent, you know, how bad the diversity is. And every company, I don't know that there was any company for, like, for African Americans that had more than 3%. I, I don't know if there was none one. None of the large ones. Yeah, well, none of them. And, and you know, this, and when you looked, not all the numbers that were released, you didn't, they didn't go really deep. But if you look deep, you could see uh, someone brought up about where these women that were in the companies were sitting. And they were not in the engineering team at all. You know, so or in senior management. In, and senior part. management, absolutely. So I think one of the things is that really diving deep into those reports and looking at how these industries are um, operating and what their employee um, workforces are now, we can really have a little bit of ammunition to address some of these. Um, so I wanted to raise two points. One is I think technology executives will tell you there's a, there's a huge pipeline problem that if you look at hiring and you look at the, the incoming resumes and it, it's that's where I think policy makers can help tremendously. There is, there are, it's just a dearth of, they would say a dearth of talent in some cases. Now I, I, that's controversial because there's a question of whether in fact there is, but I think overall, you know, the population in the Valley is, is highly reflective of 
of the resumes that are coming in, and, and that's, that's right. unfortunately, if you look at the resumes coming, that is, that is what we're seeing. Now, c companies are being more proactive about going out there and, be, and recruiting and being present in events that are focused around women and, um, and minority groups, and uh, it, it's all about trying to reach out and be, and be more proactive because those <coughs> things are being seen as the companies that are out there and, uh, and actively recruiting in that, those fields, you're likely to see an increase, I think, in, in the population of incoming resumes from those populations of folks. But it's not, we haven't solved that. I mean, there is, it, it's, it's a, it is a big problem. I, I think but I, I wanted to, yeah. just one other point to that, though, is that one thing we haven't touched on today is about entrepreneurs and venture capital and, and yes. founding companies right. um, having women Huge and issue. people of color actually getting the, the the funds and and because there are lots of people who are going in making pitches and walking out without any without financing right mm -hmm. and so rather than looking at simply hiring into companies I think if we look at the establishment Innovation. of new capital into new companies and think about how we can address that problem I think that will go yes. a long way as well Thank you. I'm gonna just give Kimberly a chance to leave if you okay. <laughs> leave, I don't want you to miss your plane oh yes yes thank you thank so you very much. much sorry I have to run yes Yes, uh, lots of questions. Okay, we're going to take three, three quick, one, two, three. So let's start with you. Thanks. Uh, as Dula knows, I'm not usually very shy. Thank you. I'm very shy. In <laughs> so, Good. Um, I think it's very important to talk about the policy issues. Um, and in full disclosure, I work for a company called Red Hat that has made money out of collaborative community power innovation. But I actually want to talk from the experience of my youngest daughter, who at a very early age showed a passion for math and science. And, you know, part of being a parent is knowing when to guide and when to get out of the way, and I think we did a moderately decent job of balancing the two. When she got to UT Engineering, she was one of four women out of class 120 in aeronautical engineering. I was like, I, I thought I was pretty well informed. I was shocked. Four women in a class 120. But I look back to see what sustained her from an early age, and, and, and you hinted at it, and let me try to articulate it, which is, it's not just a in my opinion, in my experience, it's not just about avoiding the stereotypes of women going into math or science or those things. We are headed in a very different direction about where innovation is coming from and the model of innovation in our country. And, you know, I do believe it's more collaborative. I think it is more community powered. And I think back, and I think that one of the most important things for my daughter was learning early on how to participate in those communities and collaborate. In, the, in this case, she became a rabid uh, engager of fan fiction. And it gave her that power to contribute online, get feedback. And, and let's face it, being in the IT world, I hate to use a male analogy, it is a body contact rugby sport. I, I, mean, you just I was just going to ask you, 70% of women in that field change their avatars and their names to male names because they need to avoid harassment. And she was very blessed like, you know, to go right. to a great local high school that it was all women, which I think is a whole other. Mm -hmm. I think that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> it's good and bad. Uh, in <laughs> schools. Um, I went to Wellesley, by the way, uh, so I'm all. So and, and they were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Science had a very good math and science program, but it, but that, and it's a question for girls and boys. There's a right. different process now of engaging in innovation, and engaging in product stuff that I think. Early on, you got to get them used to it. you got to get them comfortable with it. Right. You're going to have some scars. You're, I mean, let's face it, this is not a sort of, you know, tea party kind of environment. But I think early on, getting them familiar with that and comfortable with it and right. being afraid of it, I think it's very important. And you're, just the stereotypes about Melvin yeah. Science. Yeah. But the, you're addressing, directly addressing speech dominance. You're directly addressing changing I the dynamics that. of speech dominance. Yeah. Um, two. Well, let's follow uh, both your point and uh, some of the people in it said. The, um, this is a tech policy conference, but education policy figures in it. So, so much of what I've heard, including much your 10, 7, 5 year olds. <laughs> you got that right. Yeah, well, I suspect go to a school where the, everybody's encouraged to, to study. But what are corporations and internet companies going to do, or can they do, to reach out to, to get these kids at 5, 7, 10 years old and say, hey, STEM is cool, math is cool do stuff and get them continuing on through the career, educational career. So I do think the onus is on the companies a little bit to, to educate and to create safe spaces and to create technology that <clears throat> resonates with the different age groups. And I know some of the 
great big brand names in, in Silicon Valley are looking at how do we make interfaces that are really usable to uh, the most young, the youngest population. I'm not as worried about the companies as I am about the parents. And I think Mark's, Mark's scenario reminds me of, of, uh, of several we've had in, in our house where, you know, girls have wanted to sign up for summer camps and there are no girls at, at science math camp. And, you know, in one of our neighborhoods, there's no other girl at the Lego camp. There was no other girl at the coding camp. And so I actually think I'm more worried about the other parents. And so you? let me let me just finish. The, I mean, science we see all kinds of things that can be supported <coughs> yeah. at, at an early age and continue that relationship. So uh, let me just finish the thought, which is that I see an inherent bias in, in the other parents who have, are afraid of technology. It's not even right. just a boy-girl thing, although I, my girls are at an all-girls school, and I do see them being channeled into the arts and, and away from, from science and technology. But I also see a fear and loathing of getting kids online early. And I understand that we all see the, 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 the terrible, you know, the stalking, the, and, and we, should, we haven't talked about women and voice and the right. quenching of Actually, voice. And, 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 and I don't know what's going to happen. We, have, <laughs> we don't have time for all of this. But I am very concerned about, and, the, and these are, this is in a relatively elite educated population saying simply, I don't want my kids online until they're 16 years old or whatever, right. that's not the answer. I don't know how many parents there are in the room, but I've given right. this lecture at PTA meetings. And that is not the solution. The solution is, I think, hopefully a lot closer to what I do, which is my kids know every time the they turn on the computer, no names, no addresses, right. no personal information. No, like, I mean, they, they can recite it in their sleep now. But my daughter has a YouTube channel. I am incredibly proud of this. Some of the other little girls in her school were making fun of her because they, I think they frankly were jealous that their moms and dads were not letting them get on YouTube at age 11. And so I, that's a whole other conversation. But I, I think the onus is on the companies who are promoting good technology to think about all levels of there. But there's a real, you know, there's a controversy about marketing to children and safe spaces and COPPA and that sort of thing. But there, I think the onus is also on the parents, and that's that's. But that's Stephen not even about technology, though. Well, it's but to that point, that you're to that about. point, I just think we need to broaden what we think of as technology. I agree with you. Because, and I, I laughed because when Uber was going through some stuff recently, there was an Onion headline that said, you know, technology <laughs> sector disavows Uber. Dis it's a technology. It's a transportation company, not a technology company, right? Company. But, but, that's right. but, yeah. but it in fact, app, what is a technology company, right? I mean, They're every all... single company needs technology to deliver product today, whether it's a car or, uh, you know, a dress or uh, Lego or, you know, or search or whatever it is or mm -hmm. virtual reality or games. Everything is a technology company. And if we think of it that way and more broadly, you're going to get, it's going to be a bigger umbrella. You're going to, it's a bigger tent. So, so it's 2.15 and I'm sure many people, as I am, are happy to know that there's coffee being served <laughs> in the foyer. Um, we can keep doing this. We do have one more question. So for people who would like to go, um, please do. I, I don't know if you can stay for one more question. Why don't we wrap up and let people go? And then, and then yeah, we should. Yeah, if you'd like to leave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Where was your last question? Uh, last question? Yeah. Uh, so I have a narrower question, uh, which is when I graduated from law school a decade ago, the University of Wisconsin was very proud to announce that my law school class was 50% women, which is a stat that is now hit almost every law school. Mm -hmm. uh, medical schools are graduating close to 50% women. Um, those are pretty hard careers, they're pretty hard professions. Medical school, in particular, is the, like, the real thing that you go to in like, law school. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, but med for medical schools, like it, it's a STEM field, right? and we're pushing women into the field of graduating in high rates. Thanks. A third of doctors in the country now women, a third of lawyers in the country now women. How how are those demanding professions graduating such an intense pipeline of women who are going on to succeed and reach high levels? But we can't do it in engineering. We can't do it. Well, I I would I would. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would, not, I would, yeah. I mean, they're they're graduating, but are they are they reaching the the top echelons? Twenty those? years out of law school, I'm one of the last people working of they're, my girlfriends yeah. from law school. So they just the, fall the, right the, off. The premise is good, but the outcome is not. Yeah, right. That's part right. of the problem. That's a very good right. point. Right. At least they've got the pipeline, right. and then we got to get to the structural and work life right. and all the other issues. But so have you read any um, books? There are many, many superb books about early computing. Yeah. Um, so you know when you read those books and they 
depending on the ones you read, I tend to read those with a feminist bent written by feminist technologists. Um, there were some very explicit early stage changes that have butterfly effects, right? And those happened in the late 70s and early 80s. And we're, li we're living with the consequences of those things now. And we're trying to figure out how to dismantle their outcomes. Uh, at the same time, we're creating new butterfly effects that we're not really thinking about very hard, I think. That's um, a really good question, but I mean, if... <laughs> <laughs> but but I, think, I think there are some very specific ways that that happened. And you could see it in media. You could see it in the way computing was advertised, right? I mean, men were always standing over a desk and a woman was typing because women can type and men tell them how to do it. And that was like ubiquitously true in the early 80s, right? I mean, we all like technology. I graduated from college in the late 80s too and I loved tech. But that grabs little brains and shapes them in ways that we're dealing with now. And you can really see the life cycle of those ideas as they explode. I mean, I don't know if you have a different answer, but I put a lot of power into the way culture shapes imagination. And um, it didn't happen before the early 80s the same way. There's a really good quick podcast on Planet Money. And it's about why in 1984 the rates yeah. of women in coding plummeted from here to here. Down. And in every other field they were going Yeah. Up. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like uh, October Planet Money. Planet Money? Yeah. So yeah. Really yeah. There are some great books that, that they just lay it right out. I just have a quick question. We talked about parent responsibilities and then we talked about companies and what they can do. I just want to address educators um, because when I was in school, in grade school, a lot of my peers would say, why am I learning this? I'm never going to use it again. Mm -hmm. And our educators didn't have a good answer. Yeah. I don't know if that's changed now. I hope it has. But I mean, then they could have told me, oh, you could be this, you could be that. Right. But I never got that answer. Instead, I just wanted to get a good grade rather than think about career. Right. So what, what are the educators? I think they're having these conversations. I mean, the, the meeting that I mentioned before was specifically about educating educators in tech. So um, we have to stop this really great conversation. <laughs> thank you both so much. And thank you all for coming today.